Hello, my name is Ben Oliver. Um, I'm the editor in chief of 360, and I want to welcome you to the first in a series of four podcasts on robotics. This series is um, kindly sponsored by Stryker, and uh, for today we're going to focus on predominantly total knee replacement and partial knee replacement. And we're very lucky to have um, two expert surgeons from Edinburgh. We've got Sam Patton on the line, who has been instrumental in the introduction of robotic surgery in the Edinburgh in Edinburgh itself, initially in the private sector and now moving across into the NHS. Uh, and we're also fortunate to have Nick Clement, who is a paper machine in his own right. And I'm sure people have read something written by Nick, even if they don't realise that they have. Um, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about his experience of becoming a uh, surgeon who's enthusiastic about robotics. Um, so I think in the first instance, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me, for giving up your time this evening. And I think it'd be helpful for you to just sort of talk us through how, how you ended up in Edinburgh being so, so keen on robotic surgery. Thanks, Ben. So I think in Edinburgh, we've had a, a, a very strange experience when it comes to partial knee replacement. And we started off in, if we go back to about 2005, I actually wrote a paper in clinical orthopedics that looked at a series of total knee replacements and a series of partial knee replacements. And we essentially found that the two groups functionally were the same, although there were ceiling effects on the scoring system that we were using at that time. But the survivorship of the partial knee replacement was significantly lower or worse than mm. that total knee replacement. That, and that was the sort of time when the Oxford Group Publishing uh, quite impressive results for, for unis and I remember reading your paper as a trainee actually you probably won't believe it as a trauma surgeon now but I did read your paper as a trainee and, and, and discussed it some time ago you know and, and and there was a stark difference between what was coming out of the originating centre and I believe a centre in I think the centre in, in Belgium or Norway was included in that series as well if I remember and and what other people were finding and why do you think that was? Yeah well I think if you look back at these sort of survivorship figures that came out of the joint registries you know, you were, start, you were seeing knee replacements performing at around about a high 90s survivorship and partial knee replacements coming in significantly below that, really in the, in the high 80s. So there was a significant difference. And that is still mirrored, in fact, in the National Joint Registry. So th the question is, why was that? And I think you know, what, one of the reasons is that a partial knee replacement particularly I think has always been quite difficult to put in. And there are surgeons, and the Oxford group have clearly shown this, that if you put it in very well, you can get very good results. And, and, and that is true, but that is not mirrored around the rest of normal practice. And certainly wasn't mirrored, I think, in, in the studies that we did, which very much followed the results from the National Joint Registries. So I, I think there are probably several reasons it's difficult to put in, it's difficult to get it well aligned, it's difficult to get the size right, it's difficult to make sure that you don't put the knee into valgus or into a poor alignment. And that means that your failures, your early failures from fractures, from difficulties with, with tension, in other words, spitting out a mobile meniscus, for example, or malalignment from, from overloading your lateral compartment, for instance, and getting rapid joint wear in other parts of the knee. And I think those, were, those are the things that probably made partial knee replacement results inferior to those of total knee replacement. And just, just quickly touching on that, I know we need to move on, but my own experience as a trainee, it's been a long time since I've, since I've been involved in in knee replacement at all but you know the start the, the, the starting thing about unis was some of the patients did really very very well and some of them did really not so well and yeah. you know i know you're talking about the average result being comparable but actually there seemed to be more of a spread amongst the unis and, yeah and I, I think there was a feeling of the rule of fives and the rule of five was that two were excellent two were pretty good and one was awful and I think that, you know, that that was the feeling about that operation. And so a lot of surgeons didn't take it up because they were actually frightened of it because whilst they knew they could get some great results, there were some that were a bit of a sting in the tail. And, and many of those to do with patient selection, many of those are to do with patient, uh, with, with technique. But I think a lot of them were due to the inherent difficulties of putting in a partial knee replacement well. Yeah. 
And so, so having sort of established that things were not quite even, how did that lead you to, to robotics, I guess? I mean, it's, it's not a widespread thing in the UK at the moment. I guess it's probably more commonly used overseas. I know there's a big cluster in Australia like it and, and large parts of the US are, are involved, but I've never actually seen a robot for, for joint replacement other than on a display standard at a um, show. Well, I suppose my history was that I did a fellowship in Grenoble where they were using some of the very early navigation systems and of course, navigation is one of the key elements of how the robot works. In other words, the computer has to be able to see where the human is in space. And, and so navigation was a key component of that. But we all saw, didn't we, that there are many hospitals with navigation systems sitting, gathering dust in the corner. Yeah, because the operation really was on. the same, but took longer. <laughs> the, technology, the technology step, I don't think, was just quite enough. I think... I think you know, it's good, and uh, you know, there are, and that's why it took off in Australia because they're big navigators. But the next step really is to have the precision of cut, so that you that these things fit in well. And and for instance, if you if you go to IKEA on a Saturday afternoon, you will see the quality of carpentry, the fact that the joints of the tables and the furniture fit absolutely exactly, whereas if, I'm, if I botch together two bits of wood, I'm lucky if they're straight and I'm lucky uh, if they fit together. You should see so my think... IKEA builds. <laughs> <laughs> and I suppose the beautiful thing is with modern robotic systems is they don't come with the difficult IKEA manual, yeah. uh, which you have to interpret, you know, it's, put it this way. Just, just digging back a little bit, You've talked a little bit, Sam, about, you know, navigation and triangulation in space and, and robotics allowing you to do a more complex cut. For people who've not seen it or, you know, somebody like myself who's not used, how, how does that actually work? So when you when you get the patient in front of you, you've got the robot in your hand. What, what actually does it do? How does it do I tie those things together? So, so just as you would in a navigation system, the system that we are using is CT based. So the patients have a preoperative CT scan. And then you allow the computer to see where it is by putting markers in the bone and registering the bone. So wherever you move the femur or the tibia, the computer can see you. The, the next step is that, of course, once you've done your approach to the knee and, you know, you still need to do a significant approach because you still need to get the implants in. But, but I have found you don't need to do nearly as much dissection around the joint because because when you take the burr and the surgeon is in control of the burr, the burr is controlled by a boundary. So there is a haptic boundary in which the drill will work or the saw or, or burr, whatever. And if you try and go outside that boundary, the robot actually physically won't let you. And if you force it, because you're a big, strong man and a standard orthopedic surgeon, you will find that the burr eventually then switches off. Yeah. So it, it, it is very tightly controlled within parameters and a boundary set up with the, with the plan that you have for every case. Before you even approach the patient, you've actually put the implants in on a computer screen. So you've actually put the implants in and sized them up. And... And I generally find I can actually open the implant that I'm going to use before I've even started the case because I know exactly what size it's going to be. And is, it, is that actually accurate? Because, again, you know, scaled X-rays, templating, you come to within one size or another. Is it actually accurate? Off a CT it is. Scan? Yeah. So I think this is the big difference between this technology and navigation is that this is absolutely you know, I, when I did my first one and put the implant in, it just clicks in to the holes that you've made. It's perfect. You put the plastic in and the knee runs through a beautiful range of movement and the knee is stable in all positions. I mean, it, it, the, the, the power of that moment when you first put your first one in is quite strong. You know, when you did it, you just thought, well, actually, now we're on to something. And, you know challenge all, sound, all sounds exciting but isn't it just that it's something new i mean you know every patient's got to have a ct scan now time in theater press resources got to buy the expensive robot 
And how, how do you square that away as your clinical director on you? Is that, is that right, Sam? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. How do yeah. you square that away with your institution? So <clears throat> I suppose the first thing is, is that we brought it into the private sector. And, you know, obviously you have to make a business case for that. So there has to be a business case that runs behind that. In other words, you can't have a system that's going to take forever, costs a million bucks, and uh, uh, patients get no benefit out of. And, and, and this is really where I, where I brought Nick in. And Nick was newly appointed as a consultant in Edinburgh. And, and uh, Nick, I think you can probably take a bit of the story from there, can't you? Yes, that'd be great, Sam. Thanks. Just, just to get back to Ben's point about the CT scan and, and the size and the calibration, every CT scanner that's used, they're all calibrated by Stryker. So they're accurate within a few millimetres. So, But I, I sort of meant to a certain extent, you know, I mean, I, I, like you guys, I work in a really big regional referral centre in Nottingham, you know, turning around and saying the hundreds of joint replacements we do a year will need a CT scan would would put an additional resource what? stress, I guess, on the institution. What's you the do... cost of a better outcome from a patient, though? If it was you, I mean, you had the option of a total knee replacement. Well, the official nice answer, me. answer, Nick, or do you want the answer if it was me? <laughs> if, it was you, if it was you, and you had me doing your knee replacement, or, or you Can had Can I have Sam? Is that, is that allowed? <laughs> <laughs> so... If yeah, so, but that's the thing, isn't that that's patient versus population medicine, and, and as surgeons, we should yes. always think about our patients. I completely agree, but but unfortunately, our managers don't sit in clinic with the patient, and you know, so there is there, there is that side of things, and and I guess you know you've already touched on on the poor outcomes and and, and revision for pain and so on, and you know, I, I examined a PhD relatively recently looking at pain following total knee replacement, and, and was somewhat surprised in my background reading because I was going to take the guy to task about the fact he'd put 15 to 20 percent of patients have persistent pain after knee replacement that must have come on in the 20 years since I did my first knee replacement and it turns out it hasn't no yeah I agree with you Sorry. just just on the cost economic side of things so I agree and 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 we've tried to get it into the NHS in in Lothian that's my first job as a consultant three years ago last Friday we got the robot in the NHS after three years of hard work I haven't, even, I haven't even used it on a patient yet so but during that time we've had to come up with business cases so i've been we've been through it all and first thing we did was a markov model using a published data out there markov model just models as, just, as it's 360 i'm going to take a liberty give us two minutes on markov modeling so markov modeling just uses already published data so outcomes at one year two years three years eq5d or some cost utility whatever it might well be sf60 whatever it might be then you model that for that patient's lifetime and then you use published figures for revision so we use published figures for revision which was far better than manual unicompartmental these up until eight years and then after the eight years we used normal revision rates because we don't know what it is that, so just, that's the key to reading a markov modeling paper isn't it it's one of those things that if you have good quality outcome data you can get some really powerful results and you can work thresholds out whereas if you have poor case series and the nice thing about knee replacement is there's really good quality data out there yes but it does depend what you choose and it does depend that's how biased idea. you want to be because you can't you're exactly right that that table there, there'll be one table in the markov model that tells you how how everything was modeled and if you choose one of the worst outcomes for, say, a total knee replacement or manual knee or manual unicompartmental knee versus the best outcome for, say, a robotic knee, you can certainly skew the results. But anyway, we used the mean of, 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 of the published data the best we could at that point in time. And due to the better survivorship during the first eight years, it was, it was over 50% less. The cost per quality was around about £1,000. So it's way under that 20000 that nice quote. So, so, so a, a challenge here, Nick, if you uh -huh. know, I'd like to ask a challenging question. So oh. why, why not just send them all to Oxford or the originating centre and save the money on the robot? I think that's such a, a poignant bit. If you're doing lots of these, I don't know whether you need a robot. And that's, that's the truth. And Mark Blythe did the kind of the groundbreaking study about 2012-ish. And he showed, even with him, fantastic surgeon, brilliant. Um, and he does lots of Oxfords, but even with the robot, he was far more accurate with the Mako than he was doing it manually. But he wasn't able to show a functional difference between the two groups. And I think that's probably why, because he's so good. In the average person's hands like me, I think 
that that wouldn't have occurred. However, also in his study, because he used the Oxford score as his outcome, he, he also used the Forgotten John score, which doesn't have that ceiling effect that Sam was talking about. And he did show a better outcome from the Forgotten John score. In, so maybe it was just using the wrong tools to assess the outcome. But, but I agree with you. I, I think if you do lots of Oxfords, you probably don't need a robot. But I don't know very many people do lots of Oxfords. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they do. And, you know, it, it is an interesting question because that, that brings us then on to, you know, NJR, National Joint Registry, constraints on surgeons, low volume, high volume, you know, how many do you need to do? So we're going through a process in our place where, where certain surgeons are being told they don't do enough unis. And so, so they should all be centralised on one or two surgeons, even a very big institution. You know, I guess the question is that if you're using a better way of inserting the implant and you can prove that that perhaps allows for less populous places to offer these facilities without or offer these operations without somebody having to travel miles and miles yeah. i mean ben i think that the national joint registry shows about 11 percent of patients get a uni yeah and you know in oxford they're sort of in the sort of 40 to 50 percent area i think they are. and and, and, you know, so you're talking essentially about half, nearly half of knee replacements perhaps being suitable for a unicompartmental knee replacement. And if, if you look at my private practice, last year was 50-50. And I, I regard myself as a pretty conservative surgeon. Now, I may have had some excess referrals simply because I'm doing that, but, but I... You know, that was a shock to me that it had taken over perhaps quite so much. And, and if it is going to be 50-50, then that is part of standard practice, is it not? It is. And, and, I think and if we're turning knee replacement, total knee replacement, more towards partial knee replacement, because we feel that patients recover quicker and have a more normal feeling knee and a better forgotten joint score, plus also we can reduce their length of stay. And, and one of the things that really pushes knee replacement towards a uh, 23-hour, you know, single-day stay, then it has got to be converting your total knee replacement population into a partial knee replacement mm. population. And if you can do that, well, you know, that instantly dismisses the cost of any CT scans or anything else like that. Oh, no, I, I absolutely agree. And I think I think one of the things that's important to, to remember with with designer series is people often people often kind of discount them but it's not it's not the one or two people in oxford that design the joint it's the whole group and i genuinely believe what they publish and as you say it's a volume thing isn't it you know if you do a lot of them you get really good at it like anything else and and there is that thing about 24 hour stay and you know enhanced recovery and so on which you can do with a partial you can't do with a total so well no i get it i get it i just and i think it is important to 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 sort of talk around the, the topic in terms of volume and, and what the what yeah. what a, a better jigging system and a better constraint system can offer. I think the robot itself just makes the average surgeon the same as everybody else. Like we're coming out of lockdown, none of us have yep. done very many operations, and all of a yep. sudden you're dealing with a robot, you can do the same knee time and time and time again. So so that's that's the point really, is that getting rid of that rule of fives, the very first Mako that I put in. It took a while because I was doing it with two of my friends and everything else. And we, we had a chat and it took, it took a while. But of course, now I can put in a Mako Uni in 45 minutes. But the point is they've all looked the same. So the very first one was put in well. And they've all been put in well ever since. So, you know, they, and they all look the same. You, you sort of get fed up of looking at the post-operative x-ray because they all look the same. There isn't an outlier or there isn't one that's a bit wonky. They all look the same. So just just talking about that in terms of practice, so we talked about how you kind of evolved your practice, what the drivers behind it were. And, you know, I get that. It's removing the low outliers and moving the average up. So what does your practice look like now between the two of you? Nick first, I guess. So, you know, in your ideal in your ideal practice, what proportion of patients get a total knee? What proportion get a uni? And, and how many of them do you use a robot for? That's a really simple question for me. 100% get a total knee replacement because I mean, I, I only work in the NHS, I don't do any private work, and we've only just got the robot in the NHS. So, so all my patients, I discuss it with them, I give them the option. Two of my colleagues do manual uni compartmental knees, and if they want to go over to do to have an Oxford, but I often quote the revision rate is 3%, or the revision risk, sorry, is 3% at 10 years as opposed to 
10 to 12 percent at 10 years with their Oxford and most people go for a total knee replacement so hopefully that might change in the coming months to years and well, what's your aspiration so we're you know I mean you, you're a data-driven guy where, yes. where would you hope to be in three four years time well I must admit when I first came across the mega booth four years ago in Newcastle with Prof Dehan I didn't really believe so much in the make. I thought it was just a way of making money, publicization, and but the more I see, the more data I see, using it in the lab, seeing cases done in Newcastle, total knee replacements. I do think I definitely think it's the way forward. It's the future, isn't it? It has to be. Like it's more accurate. It's 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 I think it's, it probably is. It has to like there's no way around it. It has to even me and I hate technology. You've got to <laughs> embrace it. And even for research, all of a sudden it's the best research tool in the world because we can put the thing in. We can do all these models and try and figure out who does well. But actually, it's how it's put in, how it's balanced. And now, all of a sudden, we can that pattern of arthritis gets that knee replacement with that gap, with that size implant and that alignment. It's just it's going to be it's going to revolutionise. I can just see ten years, twenty years time, I'm gone. Right, you come in with a various knee with this pattern of arthritis. Bang, bang, bang. You get this knee knee replacement in this orientation done out out the door and i think they'll just be obviously we're at the very beginnings of it but i think that's where we're going to head do you think it's going to take on table decision making entirely to pre-operative planning and I, I remember being taught you know downsize an anterior shift and all those other things that you're taught and you know take a little bit off here gap well, balancing all that kind of yeah. stuff is is that out the window it is no I I, well no, I, don't, I think a bit of disagreement on the panel. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Because of course, the preoperative data that you've got is a static CT scan it, taken with the knee usually pretty straight. You've seen right through me, Sam. That was where I was taking you to. Okay. <laughs> so, so of course, the, the the beauty of this thing is it's a three D system, but it's a three D system that also moves. So you can assess your ligament balancing throughout the range of movement. And of course, that's an intraoperative thing. So there are many intraoperative steps and intraoperative data that you are using to finally tune where your implant and, and will it synthesize that for you? So instead of the, you know, the old sage orthopedic surgeon having a wiggle or passing the knee to the to the registrar who don't say anything else and saying, isn't this wonderfully balanced? Does it does it give you a, a readout? It gives you a readout, but of course, like all systems, it you know it depends on to some extent the data you put in. So one of the one of the bits is stressing that medial collateral ligament and putting it through a range of movement, and allowing the computer to assess a physiological tension on that ligament. For instance, if you're doing a medial uni, and and of course it it, it interprets that. So if you're a big rugby prop forward, and you put a lot of stress in it, you'll 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 do more than than somebody who isn't stressing it so much. It, you need to have a little bit of surgeon feel in it, but it does make it good. So, so next question then. Just to follow you... on from that, ju 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 just because there's no pressure sensors for the uni knees, but there's a recent study by Kiani et al with Varus Adad's patients for total knees. And when, when it's done with the robot, the, the dynamic balancing of the knee, it, it's perfect using a sensor within the knee. It, it's, it's within 15 pounds on either side. So this thing's the most expensive gap balancer we've got. And it does it within a couple of millimeters. Yep. No, I get it. I get it. Another question. So you guys have both learned to do total knee replacement the same way that I was taught by feel and a little bit of interoperative now and um, getting an idea of what feels right. What do the next sort of trainees get? How do they get that experience? How do they know when the robot's got it wrong? It's just, it's, it's a bit like doing an arthroscopy, isn't it? Because I was brought up and, and I remember watching a couple of open meniscectomies, but I've never done one. And it's not part of my vocabulary. Just as the trainees today do not use a pen and paper, they use a computer and a tablet. And, you know, the world has changed and, and I don't think they're going to need to use those skills quite so much. Now, it, of course, this is this is moving into the future. But, you know, I, I, I do think that this technology is here and it's here to stay. It's not going to go away. It's just going to become more and more and more. So I think I think the train is here. We, you know, you, you've, you, we've sort of got to get aboard and run with it. I, I, I completely agree with you. I think if you're halfway through your career perhaps you can ignore it but i think the i think these things you know these, these are seismic shifts aren't they 
it's yeah. like you know i remember being told by a very old trainer about the time that they used to do dhs's without an ii can you imagine that now i mean you know and that's how yeah. it was done it, it was wet films and you had another go did you and, use ii's in in nottingham do you we, we do use ii in nottingham we still use wet films in, but we just... <laughs> yeah i know but you know it's edinburgh isn't it you know that's advanced for scotland <laughs> It is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, for the record, I've not done an arthroscopy in over a decade because it's the one operation that drives me really potty trying to snibble that bit of meniscus at the back of the knee. <laughs> the first thing I gave up as a consultant, 10 years, not put a scope into anything. But yeah, so yeah, I guess we, we digress a little, but one of the things I, I also wanted to kind of tease out, I guess, because again, this is 360 and we, we need to remember that is, is some of the data behind it. So Nick kind of talked a little bit about you know the, the Markov modeling and the stuff that you did to put it to put it together being being objective about it you know every previous innovation in total joint replacement because what we're basically trying to do is say is get rid of those those low outliers get rid of that 15 percent of patients that have persistent pain for whatever reason some of them we know have had the wrong operation some of them actually have a poorly functioning knee replacement what is the state of play with regards to the data that makes this different to say patient specific jigs, you know, image guidance that we've talked about, you know, what, why, why for, for you guys, is this a game changer? I think from an, um, an evidence side of things, I'm not going to get into shape matching and, and, and patient specific jigs and all of that, but standard practice would probably be a total knee replacement versus some kind of uni compartmental knee replacement for those that have uni compartmental disease and Certainly when, when we've done our studies, which were retrospective, we showed better outcomes using the unicompartmental knee. And, and when we presented that data, everybody said, well, that's what's, that's known. Unicompartmental knees do better than total knees. We know that, we know that. Well, actually, there's just been a massive randomized trial, hasn't it? And the Lancet top cut showed no difference. One year, two years, three years, four years, and five years. No, no significant difference in the Oxford knee score. Massive it's randomized. Very cross people about that study. <laughs> yes, I'm sure there is, but there's a there's there's a statement in there that's more cost effective. It might well be, but nonetheless, there's no difference in outcomes. But you've still got that revision burden, haven't you? You've still got that. No matter with people like me, you've still got that 10% revision burden at 10 years, and and all of a sudden the MAKO allows you to get rid of that 10% revision burden at 10 years because. Granted, it's early studies, stuff from Andy Pearl, HSS in New York, and Australian registry data, American, American registry data. We know that the revision rate's far less. It's approaching the revision rate that you'd see with a, a manual knee replacement. So all of a sudden, you've, you've got rid of that revision burden risk, and now you've got the, those better functional outcomes, potentially. Maybe they used the wrong outcome measure in the in the top cut and maybe that's why they didn't show clinical significant difference between the two and maybe something but we can argue that all night but certainly there's definitely studies out there that, that there is less morbidity post-operatively lower infection rates lower dvt mainly due to early mobilization shorter length of stay less pain post-operatively so all of a sudden you've got all these benefits what about that. the uni specific complications the things that put people off the plastic was spat out we had to do another operation the cut was a little bit too deep our medial plateau fracture we took more than we expected so our revision because what's always been said by by people who are sold on unis you know and i worked for somebody who was very much sold on uni i remember seeing patients who'd run marathons with their uni compartmental knee replacement there's no way you could ever do that with the total so coming back to the question you asked me, what would I like? I want that guy's knee replacement. I don't want, I don't want the average that you normally see because I'm an avid marathon runner. But you can't guarantee that because of these very specific complications. Is, is the effect to do with reducing those complications or actually a, a general improvement overall, do you think, Nick? Good question. It's a great question. So certainly data from the Australian registry would say that those early complications are less wet. This is a fixed bearing as it happens, so hopefully you don't get the... Uh, you do, you've got a problem. If you, you've got this bearing and it's fixed. Um, and there was certainly some very early early failure rates with the old polytibia that was used, which is no longer used. But certainly those early failure rates in the Australian registry were due to infection, and that might have been to early users that might have been taking a little bit longer or early problems with sterilisation around the robot side of things. But certainly... We're not seeing those early complications and the early complications we are seeing are infection and that's just that's there and right. it's difficult to get rid of them but certainly the learning curve just as you touched on earlier there's no learning curve for 
for for accuracy. Like as Sam said, all these are put in identical from day one to day one thousand. They're all put in the same, but it just takes a little longer. Your first twelve cases take longer, so maybe the early users might have an infection, a slightly greater infection risk because well, of that. So you touched in 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 your training. You were fortunate to work in Newcastle, where you know they're actually they're very enthusiastic robotics centre. Full stop. Not just just to make her. They they use all sorts of robots, as you know. So you you've got that background under your belt in training. You know what about I I never saw one in training. If I wanted to go and do you know say I was say I was a competent knee replacement surgeon, not somebody who should never touch the bendy bendy joint, and I wanted to go and go and do what you've done and start introducing it into the NHS practice. How, you know how much how much do you need? Do you need to go and spend time with somebody? Do you need just a cadaveric lab? What what is the what is the kind of upskill? Because there will be an upskill. Like I know you you sold it well, but there will be there will be an upskill because there is with everything. Just just to clarify, Ben, I was trained in Edinburgh, even though I've got this dodgy accent. It didn't give me. A, it didn't give me a job in Newcastle, so I had to go up up north. Ah, fair enough. Apologies. Apologies. <laughs> they call it training, but it's Edinburgh, isn't it? Uh, um, <laughs> Clement, so, Clement, you are fired officially now. <laughs> sorry, sorry, my volume's gone. Volume's gone. Sorry. Um, um, <laughs> Uh, so, so, so returning to my question then, so you haven't got that experience because you know Sam's told us he does them in the in the in the private sector. So how are you going to put yourself up to it? I think so, when 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 I started, I I essentially went to Australia and and learned how to do it in Australia. I visited some surgeons over there. I spent some time in working with dry bones, and then and then I did a cadaver based course. And certainly the the methodology used is that all surgeons wanting to start using this type of technology are put through a series of cadaver-based labs where they actually do do these cases and are instructed in how to do it and, and is, you know is, is that on. enough is, is the question or do you need somebody do you need a mentor somebody who can help you with the planning and that kind of stuff or so so i suppose the other aspect of this is is that the robot comes with what's called an mps which is an, an operator and that operator helps with your planning helps you make decisions and actually can act as a guide to to the things that need to be achieved in in setting up a, a program but you know so so i was scared during my first case there's no question about that it was a it was a scary moment mm. but of course in fact i didn't need to be because of course when the bits went in the thing worked and uh, you know that that's a very very satisfying place to mm. be because we're, we're at, you know, we're almost beyond early adopter stage now, aren't we? I know in the UK, it, it's sort of innovator stage, but we're, globally, you know, there are people who've done many, many hundreds, and th if not thousands of these joint replacements. And so do, we do have to just be a little bit careful about how we introduce practice when it's established elsewhere. And I guess it's heartening to, to hear that there is a, a, a well-described route for that. Yeah. Uh, so so I, th I think that that's true. And, and the other thing that, of course, we did in Edinburgh, was that we started collecting data and and then producing work that actually backed up what we had hoped yeah which is always always helpful to hear so so just just i guess fin final comments from from both of you in terms of anything that we haven't covered in terms of the edinburgh experience and the data supporting that sam should i mention a bit about tracker or or, or... yeah i think that's that's yeah. actually probably quite a good good idea just to, probably just... where we're going to end up isn't it so yeah so to try and justify the robot coming into the NHS, we are doing a study, robotic uni compartment or MACO partial knee replacement versus gold standard total knee replacement. So just like the top cat study, really looking at length of stay, um, functional outcome and all of that. So to try and justify the, the cost of the robot and hopefully that's going to be um, recruiting this summer. One year outcome is the end point. So ho hopefully in a couple of years time, we'll have some real evidence, some some real cost per quality evidence, not ma not made up stuff, made up stuff from a Markov um, Markov model. And is um, that is that open only to Edinburgh, or is that something you're looking for the centres for? No, it, it was just us when we first put this together, which was a couple of years ago. There wasn't any NHS centres that actually had it. I think Birmingham might have just got theirs, but now there's very few NHS centres with, with with a robot. Then, so I hope you've registered the protocol, or yes, Farris yes, will never well, let you publish are, it. That's on <laughs> clinicaltrials.gov. And now we are nearly there and we're going to submit to trials. But yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Which actually, you know, j joking aside, is the way to change practice, isn't it? 
you know, we all, we've all been involved in practice change and innovation and, and actually you owe it to your patients and yourselves to do it properly. And it sounds like you guys really are, which is really what you'd expect from Edinburgh as a leading light in evidence-based surgery and that kind of stuff. And that's not just because you're on the line. I do genuinely believe that, but don't tell Duckworth. But it's true. You know, you shouldn't. The fact is we're talking about robotics, which is a niche thing. It, I think I think you're probably right. I think it is going to become gold standard. It's going to become the go to. But with, there's a journey to get there. And, and how people do that is really important. You know, and it's important that, that we do it in the right way. And it sounds like you guys are. So, you know, thumbs up, as it were. <laughs> One of the other things, of course, is that the data, the data source, the data that you get from simply from doing a robotic case is enormous. So that the, the power of the data set that you've, you've actually gathered whilst doing the operation is really very, very powerful just in itself. And actually, I'm sure will will, along with various outcome measures, be used as a sort of artificial intelligence algorithm solution for many problems you know in the future and will you let your trainees do them final question for me sam chairs chairs choice are you gonna let i think i think them? it is the ideal training tool for trainees because they can't get it wrong and they get to see what they're supposed to be doing and they get that feel and they're just getting it they, they're seeing it on the computer screen they're getting the feel of the case uh, but you, as a boss, have the reassurance of knowing they can't actually really get it wrong. So let's just say you're doing, we're going, I'm going slightly off beat here, but cut position in a total hip replacement. It lets you, it, it will do that for you and it makes sure that you put your cup in the right place. Now that's a great learning resource for trainees because it's making them put it in the right place, even if they then go back and start putting hips in manually again. And, and that, that in itself is a very, very powerful educational tool. So I, I think it's an ideal tool for trainees, in fact. I think you're probably right. And I think it's also, there, there's some, you know, with the programme director's hat on, there's, there's some objective measures there, aren't there? You know, and we're, we're, we're moving much more towards competency and actually recording what people do, how they do it, how long it takes them. The decision making process as you, as you move towards and be, being forced to kind of break that down demonstrate that you've done the soft tissue balance or whatever it is and you've understood it and haven't overridden or not overridden the the, the software program you started with is, is crucial actually because evidence is all in training now sadly but it is yeah it removes some of the dark art of knee replacement as well because it's kind of it's all numbers it's all there it's not just the boss who's done it like so many times beforehand and they just do stuff that you don't know what they're doing this this kind of you can see everything that's going on alignment we we talk about measure resection we don't really do measure resection we do something in between we do mechanical alignment we're moving towards kinematic alignment or functional alignment now it's called so i think we will advance the knowledge of needle pressure rather than just this is the way i do it and that's how i balance it and you don't know what balance it. what's what's a balanced knee nobody yeah nobody knows what a balanced knee is is it supposed to be tight all the way through is it supposed to be lax in the lateral compartment is it that is a discussion for a different day, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> that is a very long discussion. So I just, just want to thank you both really for, for a really thorough overview of the Edinburgh experience, I guess, and some real insights into, into why you've made the decisions that you've made, you know, and, and, and credit to getting one of the first robots in the country available in the NHS. And, you know, I'd be interested to know how it, we're genuinely interested to know how you get on because these things are impossible, or obviously not impossible because you've achieved it, but persuading people to invest extensively in stuff they don't have to buy is actually really difficult you know and so so well done on that front i'd, I'd like to thank thank striker as well for, for supporting us with this podcast this evening and thanks very much uh, sam and nick have a good evening thank you thank you ben. Ben. Been good. thank you